The Bible is not only a book of life. The Bible is one of the greatest books in the world about dying. Yes, one of the doctrines in the Word of God is true Christian faith. I speak of the old-time religion, the faith once delivered to the saints. It is the only, is the only religion in the world that can give a man assurance about where he's going when he dies. All faith religions have one thing in common. They won't let you know where you're going when you die for certain. All fake religions say, well, I just don't believe a man can know where he's going when he dies. Yes, that's a counterfeit, and it doesn't make sense, and you know as well as I do that if there's a God in heaven above, he didn't put you down here to live 40 or 50 years and not know where you were going when you died. So the Bible is the book of death also, and the Bible is the book that tells you how to prepare to meet your God. The Bible is the only book in the world that will give you absolute assurance about where you're going when you die. The Bible says we know we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. Paul said, Paul said, I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded he is able to keep half a child committed to him against that day. You can know where you're going when you die from the Bible, God's Word. Now I'm going to draw a picture here of a man that's dying. This is the pretty picture. I don't like to talk about death. Death is a gruesome thing. They try to paint it up with satin and lace. They try to fix it up so it'll look pretty. They try to spread flowers around and make you think it's something it's not. But there's nothing pretty about death. Listen, there's nothing pretty about getting old and falling apart and dying. There's nothing pretty about a man being eaten up with cancer and dying. I don't say it's pretty. I don't say it's a lovely subject. I don't say it's a bed of roses. But I say it's a necessary subject. And I say that if I didn't declare to you the whole counsel of God and preach to you about dying, I would not be faithful in my calling as a minister. While we have ministers today in the United States who are little more than amateur psychologists trying to correct out problems of life, that isn't the big problem. The big problem is dying. The Bible says, prepare to meet thy God. The Bible said, is appointed the men once to die, and after this a judgment. Now here's a man dying. You know, death's a great separator of men. Nobody wants to die. I've lived with combat men in the infantry for nearly four years, and I've seen men under all kinds of conditions and all kinds of men. Brave men, scared men, tough men, strong men, weak men, short men, and I never met a man in my life that wanted to die. But I'll tell you something, I've known men who when the time came to die were ready, and I've known men to go through death with a smile. Yes, I've known people to go to death singing and shouting, Yes, I know that kind of thing, but I know of no person who deliberately wanted to die unless it was an easy way to get out of something. Sometimes it's easier to wish you were dead than it is to actually die. Now, no Christian that I've ever met really wanted to die, actually, and yet, and yet when the time came, it was peaceful, it was happy, and in the case of the Apostle Paul, he loved the Lord Jesus so much, he said, it is far better to depart and be with Christ. And he said, for to me to die is gain. It would be a gain for me to die. I might not want to go right now, but it would be a gain if I were to go right now, because I'd be absent from the body, present with the Lord, and to depart and be with Christ is far better. Now here's a man dying. He's on his deathbed. Pretty soon he's going to leave and pass out. Into, into what? Into what? He will be somewhere. You say, well, he just vanishes into nothing. Nonsense. Any scientist has better sense than that. You may be able to turn matter into energy and vice versa, but there's something still there. Now, there is something there. You're going to live forever somewhere. This man is dying, and as he dies, he has men come in and try to comfort him. I've drawn the first one here. The first comforter this man has is science. And I'm going to bring these three comforters in the picture. I'm going to bring them into the picture just like Job had three comforters and show you how science and religion and scholarship try to comfort a dying man. First of all, we have science. Science is going to try to say something soothing and comforting to this man, who in a minute is going to pass from here to eternity. Imagine science trying to comfort a man. Imagine trying to comfort a man by telling him that the species is gradually on the upgrade or downgrade they haven't made up their mind which just yet. Imagine trying to comfort a, a dying man by telling him about the Cenozoic period and the Paleozoic age. Why, imagine a man trying to comfort a dying man with nonsense like that. 
Now, science is good for a few things, and I thank God science has helped mankind in a few places. But don't make any mistake about it. The Bible says some have followed science falsely so-called and have erred concerning the faith. Imagine comforting a man with that kind of nonsense. Listen, when you die, you'll leave science this side of the grave. And when you come to a deathbed, it won't do any good to have some learned scientist standing there saying, well, you know, after all, uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Or perhaps he says, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Or perhaps he says, uh, uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That won't do you any good. Now listen, I'm an opera and left and hydra and paramecium and planaria may be all right for a classroom. But when it comes time to die and meet your maker, you're going to want some comfort beside the comfort that science can give you, telling you about the mighty stages through which man has passed. Most of those fellows have an evolutionary fixation anyway. They're obsessed with the evolutionary theory, which is only a theory. It never has been a fact and never will be a fact. Well, that's that comforter. Job said to the men that came to comfort him, he said, miserable comforters are ye all. He said, you're forgers of lies. You are physicians of no value. That's what he said about his, his three comforters. Let's see how this man makes out with his three. The next comforter, the next comforter this man has, uh, comes in the form of a scholarship. Scholarship. Scholarship's going to help this gentleman out. He's dying. Scholarship is going to come and tell this man that there are many spurious passages in the New Testament, and there are better renderings and readings in more modern translations. And this fellow has come to tell him that there are no mansions in his father's house. There are merely rooms or something else. Or this fellow has come to tell him that he has no place in the Book of Life, but only the Tree of Life. Yes, scholarship has come in to enlighten this poor, dying, sin-sick man that he can't count on the Bible that God gave him and that he has to look to scholarship for a more accurate translation. And a better reading in the Greek is something or other. <laughs> you say, now, you say, Pete Ruckman, I don't appreciate you talking that way. You say, I believe in an educated ministry. You do? Is that so? You do? You say, well, what books have you read? I'll answer you. I've read the same books you've read. <laughs> you say, have you read Barth and Bruner, Kierkegaard, Niebuhr, Spinoza, Leibniz, James Joyce, Ernest Hemingway? Have you read Somerset Maugham? Have you read Milton, uh, Shakespeare, Tennyson, Shelley, Keats, Wadsworth, Wordsworth, Emerson, Dickens, Thackeray, Coolidge, Taylor? You say, have you read them? Yes, I read them. You say, what do you think about them? Well, I think just what the wise man thought. He said, of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. You say, have you read the, the latest writers? Yes, I've read the latest writers. You say, what about Lloyd Douglas, A.J. Cronin? You say, what about Norman Vincent Peale? You say, what about the great philosophers? You say, what about the great psychologists, uh, psychiatrists? You say, what do I think about them? Yes, I've read a lot of stuff in my time. Yes, I've read a lot of stuff, and I've read a lot of hack writers and pulp literature. And I want to tell you, men and women, the greatest book that was ever written is the good old Bible, 1611. You can't go wrong with it. That's the book that'll tell you how to get to heaven. Scholarship will never tell you. Scholarship will probably mess it up for you. What you need, listen, what you need is salvation in Jesus. You don't need any more scholarship. <laughs> Why, the very idea. One time a little girl talked with a scholar about his soul. And he said, don't go away and don't bother me, young lady. She said, I can't go away. She said, I have to find out whether or not you're saved. He said, don't bother me. He said, I don't believe the Bible. She said, well, I do. He said, you don't believe that ridiculous story in there about the whale swallowing Jonah, do you? She said, yes, I certainly do. He said, well, prove it. She said, I can't prove it. And he said, well, how do you know the whale swallowed Jonah? And she said, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. And the skeptical scholar said, what if Jonah isn't in heaven? <laughs> she said, all right then, <laughs> you ask him. You ask him. The third comforter this man has is religion. You say, can't religion be a comfort? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Religion is mighty slim comfort alongside salvation. Religion is what everybody has. Salvation is what born-again people have. Imagine religion trying to comfort a man. Here's a man dying. In comes religion. Just any kind of religion. Religion. You say we all have our own religion. All right, religion. In comes religion and says, be good. The fellow says, I can't be good. I'm dying. Religion says, keep the Ten Commandments. Keep the golden rule. The poor old sinner says, I've broken it all my life. What am I going to do? 
Religion says, well, just think beautiful thoughts, uh, concentrate on the power of positive thinking, integrate your personality, think beautiful thoughts. The poor dying man says, I'm dying. I'm getting so I can't think. What am I going to do? And religion says, just have faith in God. And the poor sinner says, I've cussed him all my life. I can't have faith in him. And religion says, well, God is good. God is merciful. God wouldn't send anybody to hell. And the old man says, I know I'm going to hell. What can I do to get saved? All right, let's wind this thing up. These are some miserable comforters men have thought up, but thank God there's one comfort no man can take from you. Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures and was buried, and the third day he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. And he liveth forevermore, wherefore he is able to save to the uttermost all them that come unto God by him. See, he ever liveth to make intercession. Jesus said, Because I live, ye shall live also. Jesus said, I am the resurrection, the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Christ is life. Christ is comfort. And if you have him in that dark and trying hour, you can make it. He'll take care of you. He'll get you through. He hath said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. When old Dwight L. Moody died, he said, Earth recedes, heaven opens before me. When Charles Wesley he died, he said, I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Satisfied satisfied, satisfied. And then he breathed his last breath and with a long sigh, he said, satisfied, satisfied. You say, Pete Ruckman, that's a delusion. Those things aren't so. Oh, is that right? Well, if that's a delusion, then put under my head for a pillow. If that's a delusion, then hang it over my head like a canopy. If that's a delusion, then sink me in it in ocean surges and, and billows 20,000 fathoms deep. Christ said, because I live, he shall live also. Years ago in England, when old John Holland came time to die, as John Holland died, he said to his wife, he said, honey, light the candle. And she waited a while. And she brought him the Bible and began to read to him. And he said, have you lit the candle? She said, no. He said, are you sure you haven't? She said, yes. And old John Holland lifted his dying eyes to heaven and said, this room's getting brighter. Are you sure you haven't lit the candles? And she said, no. And he said, that it must be the face of Jesus that I see. That's the way to die, and men and women in the world can't give you a thing for that, and the world can give you nothing in place of that. When my mother-in-law's father died, he sat up in his bed and began to sing, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly, and out he went. What can the world give you in place of that? God help you, men and women. God help you sinners listening to my voice here. May God help you to receive his son and believe on him and come to know him whom to know aright is life everlasting.